spotlight. Okay, so good. Is everybody able to see? Uh, if you're not able to see uh, Gullion's uh, slides, uh, please let us know. But we share the spotlight for Gullion. So. Thank you. That's all. Okay, so may maybe just uh, one minute so that we can start at 10 or 5 then. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our second speaker this morning, uh, Guliang Yu. Uh, so as you can see, his title is Cyclic Cohomology and Higher Invariance of Elliptic Differential Operators. Guliang, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Masoud. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation, especially Alan, Masoud, Henry, and Patty. Um, so I would like to... Uh, I talk about uh, uh, the law of cyclic homology in studying like high invariance uh, of elliptic differential operators. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I noticed there are uh, quite a large number of students and young people. So I will try to make my talk accessible. So I have to apologize to the experts. Uh, so I, I will try to, instead of talking about general elliptic differential operators, uh, let me try to focus on just some special operators, like, uh, for example, the Dirac operator. So let me just introduce the Dirac operator. Uh, so historically, uh, I guess uh, the Dirac operator was initially just introduced for like uh, for R2. And so Dirac was interested in finding a first order differential operator whose square is just the Laplacian. Okay, so let's just you know look at this uh, very carefully. Uh, so the square, well, if we square it, that's what we get. And now here, uh, if we use the fact, I think this is called Clarence theorem, like the two second order partial derivative in different orders. You know they are the same thing. So this is crucial. So, so if we use that fact, then we are trying to find like just the coefficients satisfying these three equations. Now we, we very quickly realize it's that's not possible in the world of complex numbers. So we go to matrices, for example, if we look like uh, if we can uh, like use this set of two by two matrices, then it satisfies these equations. So, so this is, uh, gives the Dirac operator in uh, for R two. Uh, then, of course, we can uh, quickly generalize this to like R n. So this is the case of R n, and we can do the same thing. And the most efficient way of doing this and finding like the coefficient that is used using Clifford algebra. Okay, so this is just Dirac operator in R n. And now, we, of course, once we know how to do it in Rn, we uh, we can try to generalize to general manifold. Now, it's the same idea. So this was done by uh, Adia Singer. And except that, you know, we now have to replace partial derivative by covariant derivative. And, uh, and there is, of course, a mild condition on the manifold uh, to, to, for the existence. And it's a condition called spin. It's some kind of our interability condition. Okay, so when, once we construct this, now we are interested in like asking the same question, you know, is the square still the Laplacian? And, and in the case of R2 or IN, the reason, the reason the square is like the Laplacian is precisely the fact that the two partial derivatives, second order partial derivatives, they are the same, but in general, they are not. So this is precisely like uh, the commutate, I mean, and uh, the two partial derivatives, uh, how they are different, it, it exactly measures the so-called curvature. And so, so it's natural that somehow curvature should kind of pop out. And so if we sit down and uh, compute the term and we get exactly the scalar curvature actually. Okay. 
so so this is this, this formula it's uh, well it's it's uh, really nice that it established connection between uh, geometry and uh, and operate theory so if the scale curve is positive then this is invertible okay now it turns out you know uh, uh, just for the students and uh, deciding determining invertibility an infinite dimensional linear transformation is a highly non trivial matter. It's, you know, it's uh, unlike finite dimensional linear algebra, we just have to compute its determinant. So, actually, the most effective way of doing this is to uh, introduce, like, you know, uh, the, the Fred Home index. And the reason is that the Fred Home index, as it's quantity here, that's very stable and it's stable under perturbation. Therefore, it makes it like computable. And uh, so, well, that's the work of Artie Singer. So, and Artie Singer computes this invariant in terms of topological data. Okay. All right. So, so in particular, uh, you know, uh, in light of the connection with differential geometry is that if a manifold has positive scalar curvature, well, let's say it's spin, then the uh, hat genus, well, that's the pairing with the fundamental curve. That's that's zero. So I should write actually more precisely. If this is a hat class, it should be just that's zero. Okay. Now th this is quite striking because it's a condition on differential geometry. We uh, we get vanishing of some topological invariant. I think even after this many years, there's no direct proof other than going through. Uh, you know, the Dirac operate. So uh, it, it's quite beautiful. And so now, so this is of course very nice, but if if we just look at such an example, like, you know, the tallest, the n tallest, and in the case of n tallest, the a hat genus vanish because, you know, Tn can be given with the uh, Riemann metric with uh, zero coverage. Uh, so the question whether this uh, space has positive scalar curvature, that's that a single index theorem uh, would not help because uh, the obstruction vanished. Okay, so actually this, this simple looking question was open for more than 20 years and it, it, it was eventually solved by Xiang Yang and Gomor Flossen. Uh, but we now uh, actually, uh, if we use like from the point of uh, view of non commutative geometry, this become quite simple. So, so let me try to explain that. Okay. So the idea is well, actually, you know, when you look at Tn and you try to the advantage of the symmetry of the space, which in this case means the fundamental group. So we look at like Tn is realized, you know, as a quotient of Rn uh, modular as action of the fundamental group. So this is a picture. Okay, so so we have to somehow take uh, the symmetries, the fundamental group, into consideration, and that's that's what high index comes in. So I let me explain. So so I I will explain in a way that uh, I can also set up the super secondary invariant later on. Oh, okay, so let's uh, so start with like, like a compact manifold X and the universal cover is N. So we have a, a fundamental group. Uh, let me just call this G to the pi one of X. And now on the universal cover, let's look at those kernel operators, just very concrete operators like this. And also we want the support of the kernel is essentially like concentrated on the diagonal. If this is like M, M, it's like, it's like near the diagonal. So, so the so-called propagation is just the width of the diagonal. Okay, so so it's just a waste. Okay, so uh, so it's a very uh, 
very uh, intuitive concept. Now, the cyst algebra, what called algebra, is the operate norm closure of such a kind of operator. Now, actually, often in order to take consideration of the fundamental group, we look at uh, the operate norm closure of those G invariant kernel operators. So the kernel, the kernel is invariant, like if you have a group act on that, that it's invariant in this sense. Okay. Now it turns out this equivariant, so called equivariant blue algebra, is simply uh, Morita equivalent to our older friend, the group reduced group cis algebra. So, but this this is a more geometrical way of looking at it. Okay, so so now why are those algebra relevant? And uh, the reason is that um, the Dirac operator. So so even in the case of Toller, you know, you we look at the Dirac operator on Tn, then lift it to the universal cover, which is Rn, if we are looking at the Rn case. And the Dirac operator in this case, of course, is not Fredholm, but it's Fredholm in a generalized sense. So it's invertible modulo this so-called low algebra or the equivalent low algebra. Okay, so now uh, we can include, you know, the fundamental group or those cis algebra uh, into the index theory consideration. So we, we, we can make it bounded by normalizing it and define the index. Well, actually, I am going to define the index in the other dimensional case. I mean, in the classical case of the home index, say no information, but in general, in the so-called high situation, and there are a lot of interesting uh, information that it's easy to write down a formula. So that's why I choose to define it in the other dimensional case. It's the, the high index is just, oops, just, uh, so it can be just defined this way, very concrete. <laughs> okay, that's the high index, which one can easily check. It lies in this list algebra. Okay, so it's it's uh, quite concrete. Okay, so now this high index, as I, we said, this this is just for those of us who are prefer the group cis algebra. That's just a group cis algebra. Okay, so now if we try to like figure out what information is encoded in this high index, the first information is that's kind of zero dimensional information. It's given by RTS L two index theorem because you know you have you have a trace on the group cis algebra okay uh, you have a natural trace now if you take the trace of the high index it turns out you get back the fred home index so this is the fred home index okay now okay so you might say well, well you don't get anything new but but even this gives something interesting. For example, instead of the Dirac operator, you use the, like the Dalam operator. And uh, <clears throat> then this is the Euler number. So it would mean that on the universal cover, if the Euler number is not zero, it would mean that on the universal cover, you have non-trivial L2 right, harmonic form. And that's you know, not so easy to see. So, so this is already the zero dimensional information also so the invariant does not give you anything new, but there are new applications. Okay, so this, now going back to the scalar curvature problem for the tallest, this of course would not solve it, but it, we kind of see what is uh, contained in the high index uh, of, uh, uh, of the operate. <clears throat> okay, so, so, so far, you know, uh, nothing, well, uh, it's nice, but nothing exciting has happened. But so here is uh, the striking theorem. So, so I think Ellen, uh, <clears throat> of course, realized that uh, as a theory of uh, um, cyclic uh, cohomology, and uh, so we saw the definition in Ellen's talk. And uh, you know, this can be considered as a high trace. So, so in Atias uh, uh, L two index theorem, you you have a trace, but here cyclic cycle serves as like high trace. So Alan explained that in his talk, you can pair up with K theory. So this is a K theory element, it's a high index. So you can pair this up because this is essentially, this lives in the K, uh, K theory 
of the group sister algebra. Well, let's, so in this theorem, I'm, I guess, you know, uh, I'm not being very careful, like uh, whether it's a group sister algebra or it's kind of smooth algebra. For this theorem, for the statement, I think it's more in like, the algebra of invariant smoothing kernels. So this is always true. And so you have a pairing. So, oh, I think I have a typo. This is X, sorry, that should be X. Oh, <laughs> sorry. So this should be X. Okay. okay, so what's new is that if you have a cyclic co-cycle, like, associated to a group cosine. So, so what you get after you pairing it is that it's the so-called high, it's the high uh, like A hat genus. So you have another class. So let's think about the example. The example X is TN. So the A hat class here, I mean, it's everything is trivial in this example, except in zero dimension. Zero dimension is a one, the constant one. But if you choose C, for example, to be the group co-cycle, uh, so in this case, of course, G is just the N, the top dimensional group co-cycle. One, you know, the product of one with the top dimensional class and paired this up, that, you know, it's still one. So, okay. So if instead of, you know, the canonical chase like in a DS situation, and if you uh, take a high dimensional cyclic co-cycle, then, then you can detect the non-triviality of this, the high index of the Dirac operator. Okay, now there is another major technical issue here. So this formula is always true in the context uh, of the algebra of smoothing kernels. But if for the application to scalar coverture, we need the high index to be non-zero in the context of cis algebra. So for that, uh, so we need another major idea of uh, Alan. So we need like a, some kind of smooth subalgebra. So like, uh, okay, so I abuse of notation, like some kind of smooth algebra. Let me just call SGU, that's a bad notation. Okay, which has the same KCLE and for which the cyclic co-cycle will extend because cyclic co-cycle rarely extend to a cyclic algebra. So, so, so essentially it's some kind of, oops, so we need some kind of non-commutative smooth structure. Now, in the case of uh, TN, the group is the N, so this is actually relatively easy to, um, uh, such a thing is relatively easy to accomplish. Okay, but as a consequence, we, we get, you know, the tallest, TN has no positive scalar coverture, okay? And uh, all right, so this is a uh, Count Moskowitz high index theorem, uh, which is uh, quite, quite, uh, quite beautiful. Okay, now, and of course for, for TN, everything goes through like quite easily, but the next thing is, uh, you know, the application of the Count Moskowitz theorem to to the Novikov conjecture for hyperbolic groups. Okay, so this actually shows the power of uh, non-commutative geometry. So, so hyperbolic group in the sense of Gromov. So if G is a hyperbolic group, so what it means is that the Kelly graph, if you look at the Kelly graph, and uh, if you like, there exists some kind of delta such that any like, uh, geodesic triangle in the Kelly graph is kind of thin, okay? So if you pick up just one point, any point on one side, 
the distance to the union of the other two sides will be at the most delta. So, so that's uh, Gromov's uh, like hyperbolic hypervelocity uh, concept. Now, uh, what is striking is hyperbolic groups are kind of generic. Uh, that's of course very consistent. If you look at two D, you know, uh, like surfaces, mo mo most surfaces are like hyperbolic. And, but this can be made very precise, the, uh, how generic hyperbolic group is. And uh, uh, so, so this kind of, this result illustrate uh, the power of cyclical mode. Now I want to, so, so more striking, uh, it's this theorem of Allen and uh, actually the Novikov conjecture holds for the, so-called so Gelfand and Fox classes. I will not get into the details. So this is a group of diffeomorphisms of a compact smooth manifold. So this is, uh, what is striking about this is that there's no condition, you know, on the group. And um, I mean, diffeomorphism groups are very highly nonlinear. So those are like, you know, uh, highly, Nonlinear groups. Okay. Now, the the hard core part of the, the argument can be found in Allen's paper, cyclical mode and the transversal fundamental class, and. Uh, just for the young people, I, I really recommend this article because it contains a lot of uh, wonderful ideas. And so one very technical issue is uh, the issue of extending cyclical cycles associated to Gaff and Fuchs classes um, to like some kind of small stance about it. So in Alan's article, so this actually the smooth dense of algebra depends on the cyclical cycle. He used like he constructed a derivation out of like a given cyclical cycle, then use that derivation to construct smooth subalgebra. So it's it's really very beautiful. I I consider this theorem as like a triumph of uh, non commutative geometry because I, I, uh, I, there's no other direct way of proving this theorem. Okay, so, and, they, and there's also some more detailed discussion in uh, article of Alan with uh, uh, Gomov and Honey, uh, the GAFA paper. Okay, so actually, this is a theorem I have wanted to understand for many, many years. I still don't claim to, you know, to have a very good way of trying to understand this geometrically. Trying, okay, uh, but we made some cool progress. Uh, so jointly with Shelly and Jian Chao. So this article, I guess, just appeared in Gafa that we proved that if G is a discrete subgroup of the group of, of volume preserving diffeomorphisms of a smooth manifold, then the Novikov conjecture is true. Um, actually, I remember just a few years ago, I gave a talk on this in, at the Fields Institute. At that time, we had some additional hypothesis like connect in the connected component of the diffeomorphism group. Okay, so I get think, uh, people in the audience ask me, why do you need this condition? So we were able now able to remove this. Uh, I should also mention in uh, my recent well, work, which is ongoing with Sherry, Chen Chao, and Zhang, we uh, are able to remove the volume preserving condition. Okay, But to fully understand Alan's result, we, I, very much would like to remove the discreteness condition. 
And so I'm raising an open question. So that's something we still don't see how to do this. And that's, it would be really nice to do this. Um, probably, you know, cyclical homology should be uh, part of the picture, I think. But, but at the moment, I don't know how to, we don't know how to remove this. Okay. All right. So, so that's all I want to say about uh, uh, cyclic commons and uh, how uh, this can be used to detect information about like what we call primary high invariant. So primary high invariant are those invariant which are like invariant and homotopy equivalence. Okay, so, so the next thing I would like to discuss is how cyclic homology can be used to detect um, like secondary invariant. Okay, so those are more like more subtle invariant. So, so let me first like try to introduce what are secondary invariants. And I'm, I will, so those secondary invariant uh, were introduced by uh, uh, Nigel and uh, John, uh, maybe by now, was that about 20 years ago? And, uh, but I'm going to uh, like formulate those invariant in a way that it's easier to compute their pairing with cyclic cycles. So, so it's not exactly the way uh, Nigel and John introduced. This. Uh, okay, so I, I want to, uh, in a way, reformulate like K homology, like uh, Alan in his talk explained uh, the concept of K homology, but I am going to like introduce a new uh, sister algebra which will capture the information about K homology. Okay, so, so I have this. Space M, which is a universal cover like of a compact manifold. So the so localization algebra. Well, we, we can think about this as like a family. It, it's a family of equivalent kernel operators. You can think about kernel operators and parametrized by like the half line. Now, when T is going to infinity, the kernels uh, gets more and more concentrated near the diagonal. So it gets more and more local. That's why it's called as a localization. <clears throat> okay, so, so we clearly, now actually I should mention the K theory. So the K theory of this algebra, so, it, it, it's just just the K-homology, uh, maybe equivalent K-homology if I have a G, otherwise it's just K-homology. Okay. So it's just the K-homology Alan talked about in his talk. So if this is a cis algebraic, uh, like it's a, it's a cis algebra which encodes K-homology, okay? Uh, all right, so, so if we use this sister algebra to like realize K-homology, then the von Kahn map is extremely uh, expressive. So, so you see, this is like parametrized by the half line. Of course, I can evaluate, I can evaluate at zero, right? Well, you can, if you wish, you can evaluate the ones, they will give you the same map at the k theory level. Okay, so this map, this actually induces the bomb Kahn map. So, so this evaluation map, if you just evaluate the zeros, then you know it's it's a map from K homology to K theory. And 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 this of course is just a group C style. Okay. Okay, so this is a bomb map. And uh, and in a way, this like illustrate, so the left hand side is very local. Okay, so so the so right hand side is quite global. So it's like, it's a local versus global picture. And uh, that's in, in a way, of course, what's 
So one can't conjecture is about. So left hand side is local, so right hand side is very good. Okay, so so let's see. Let's see how uh, like you know you can consider put the Dirac operator into this picture. Okay, so if I have a Dirac operator, I mean uh, so I normalize it like this, and but this may not be like has well, if I normalize it, I may lose the small propagation. This operator may not have like very small propagation. So now I can, but I can make it to have small propagation in the following way. So I just, uh, you know, I just find an open cover, uh, of course, locally finite so far so on, and such that the diameter of each of the open subset is very small, okay? So then I find a position of unity subordinate to, to, to this open cover. Now I kind of chop it off in this way, uh, the original F, I chop it off, but this is, this operator is in K homology is equivalent to F. So I'm not changing anything in, uh, in the, world of Kehomot. So, but after doing this, what I gain is that the propagation of Fn is very small, okay? It's like almost one over n or maybe two over n, okay? So, so I'm, I'm like chopping this off and making it like to have small propagation, but still retaining all the Kehomot information, okay? All right, so now for between different n, I just linearly linearly connect them. Okay, so now this family of f has propagation, very small propagation. Okay, so now now I can use this to define the so-called local index, which is in a way just the cohomology class corresponding to the Dirac operator. So this is a formula. It's just like the definition of high index. It's the local high index if you use. Oops, I can say local, local high index, yeah. And if you evaluate, of course, you get the index, okay? All right, so so this is a, just a very natural kind of construction. Um, all right, now, this is a sister algebra way of like trying to capture uh, how local differential operators are. Of course, differential operator just take derivative, you know, when you take a derivative, the value of the derivative at the one point only depends on like point nearby. So it's like you don't change support of. So, I mean, differential operators are very low in this sense, okay? Uh, all right, so what are secondary invariants? So those uh, invariants introduced by uh, uh, Nigel and John, these are invariant uh, which can be defined when the primary index invariant is zero, in particular when, you know, so in that case, uh, they are invertible. So of course, you, we don't have any like primary invariant. Okay, so those are invariant which like measures, so, I mean, the operator D itself, of course, is very local, but the inverse, the inverse in this case are often not so local, okay? So those invariants are designed to measure like, they are serve as like obstruction to, to the inverse be very local. Okay, all right, so let's look at two very concrete situation where, you know, you have like, uh, naturally, the, Dirac, uh, the operators are invertible. So one is when it has positive scalar curvature, then the Dirac operator, of course, is invertible. Now, there is another very interesting case. So if we start with a compact manifold, you know, in topology, we would like to consider other manifold which are homotopy equivalent to F, but may not be homeomorphic 
12. Okay. All right. So in this case, we can define a so-called relative signature of it or relative dalam operator to begin with. And so you look at some kind of mapping cylinder or mapping cone, so so it's, it's which realizes the relative dalam cohomology. And so you know you have the same boundary map, but you to the operator has also includes this homotopy equivalent. So that's essentially the idea. Okay, now, now you can like introduce this like relative dalam operator or signature operator, and that's the relative one. And if f is a homotopy equivalence, then this operator will be will be invertible. Okay, so so this is another natural situation. You have a invertible operator. Uh, I should uh, comment that. Uh, so my description description here is quite in, like it's a more pedagogical description to to implement this. Uh, there are some technical issues, so this was resolved by Hilson, Scandalis, and also uh, Zenobi in the topological manifold case. All right. So so in this case, in this case. The secondary invariant matches how far F, the homotopic equivalence, is from being a homeomorphism. So, so that's why it's interesting. Uh, okay, so so let's let's define what precisely what secondary invariants uh, are. Uh, so, it, if we have an invertible operator, then then there is the natural trivialization of the high index. It means that you know I, there exists a homotopy H, which connect uh, to the high index to something trivial. Okay. So if we put this together, this this part from zero to one, then then the local high index, like from one to infinity. If we put this together, then this gives you the so-called high-low invariant. High-low invariant. Okay. Now I have to emphasize where this invariant lives. It lives in this so-called oops, I think um, in the case of this CL zero algebra. So CL zero algebra, I should explain this actually is fits into this exact sequence. This is the evaluation. Let's see evaluation at zero and oops, G and um, C star and G. Okay, there is this exact sequence. Of course, this is essentially the group cyst algebra. So you see, this is the CL zero algebra is the obstruction to like to this map, the bomb core map in the K theory level to, to being an isomorphism. Okay. Now we are not doing this at the classifying space level. So so that's important. Otherwise, you know. When the bomb con conjecture is choose, we have a trivial case theory, so there's nothing there. So this this like measures the deviation for the map being an isomorphism. Okay, so this lives there. Okay, it, the high low invariant lives the case theory of this system. Okay, so we already explained that in the case of two more manifold being a homotopy equivalent, then the high-low invariant measures like how far the homotopy equivalence is from being a homeomorphism. But in the scalar curvature case, it's also interesting. For example, if I have two um, like positive scalar curvature metrics, and uh, so the high-low invariant will help you to identify if that two Metrics are in the same connected component in the modularized space of 
or part of the scale coverage metrics. Of course, any two Riemannian metrics are connected in the world of just Riemannian metrics, but they are not necessarily connected in the world of positive scale coverage metrics. Okay. All right, so that's another interesting, like, you know, uh, application of time. Okay, so, so uh, once we know it's interesting, then we, you know, we try to compute this. Okay, so the first thing to do is to do something similar as the L2, like the idea, the L2, like index here. Okay, so, so we try to pair up with some trace. And uh, so this is, uh, we use so called delocalized trace. Okay, so H is a group element in the fundamental group, which is non trivial. Okay, so here the F is just a fundamental domain uh, of. All right, so this is this gives you a trace. Now this localized trace can be paired with like the K theory of uh, of the CL zero algebra by using this formula. Okay. Now there is one easy here. And um, it's there is a like important technical issue, which is you know the convergence issue. So I'm kind of a little bit neglecting here, but I want to mention that the reason we use this uh, like localization algebra, you know, parametrized by the half line, it it matches extremely well with uh, what happens in like geometric analysis, like for example, in uh, like unlocked delocalized data invariant. Also it it integrates, oops, uh, that's dt from zero to infinity. So it exactly matches very well, okay? This is the delocalized data invariant. So there is a convergence issue when we try to pair it up. And so in order for things to converge, so in uh, this article of design and mind, so if we assume like the conjugate classes, uh, not the group, okay, only the conjugate class of this group element has polynomial growth, then all the convergence easy goes away. So in that case, uh, the pairing of the delocalized trace it gives exactly lots like delocalized data. Okay. Uh, so, so that, uh, and that this is the result of the computation. Okay, so now from there, we already get some interesting result. And uh, so if the bomb con conjecture, well, actually only need the rational, but holds for G, if the conjugate class has polynomial growth, then the delocalized data has to be an algebraic number, okay? If it has infinite order, then this is zero, actually. Uh, I should mention, if G is torsion free and satisfies the bomb con, then Paolo and uh, Thomas proved the vanishing of this, uh, well, I guess in the, infinite order case by using a different method. Uh, I also should mention that uh, the proof of this corollary use a theorem of Boling Wang and Han Wang. Okay, so so this this is kind of uh, interesting and in light of this result we I want to raise an open question like in general, what value? So it becomes interesting what value of John Lotus delocalized A invariant possibly possibly have. You know, are they always algebraic? So well, the thing is that it's what's interesting is that if you try if you get a transcendental number, then it's very likely. Well, it will be a counterexample to the um, conjecture. 
this is a little bit, the situation is a little bit similar to ideas like uh, auto baby number uh, problem. You know, uh, people uh, succeeded uh, in uh, Tim Austin and uh, I think uh, several others succeeded in coming up with examples out of L2 AD numbers, uh, which are transcendental. So, so I, I feel like that it's, it's quite possible. One can, you know, those invariants are not too far from L2 AD numbers. Okay, so I just would like to raise this as an open question. Okay, so next we will try to do something like what Alan and Henry did for like high index, try to pair uh, like high dimensional cyclical cycles with those secondary invariants. Okay. Okay, so 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 here I'm just writing down like a, a kind of formula, you know, and if you have a delocalized co-cycle, how would you pair up with a KCR element? And that's that's the formula, which is like very analogous to to the pairing in the one dimension, zero dimensional case, the trace, you know, it, it's very similar to, to, to the second formula here. Okay. But it's a more like high dimensional case. So of course there is a convergence. So whether this converges or not, that's that's a kind of a technical issue. Okay, so uh, so I'm being a little bit vague here. So the pairing can be uh, in if we don't worry about convergency, then it can be expressed in terms of John Lotus, so-called high ADA invariant. So it matches well with what's happening in geometric analysis. In the hyperbolic group case, the pairing can be done at the level of cis algebra. Okay. And so actually I should say for all the important applications to scalar curvature and to like homotopy like structure group, a homotopy, whether homotopy equivalence of manifold implied homomorphism. For all that kind of question, we want the pairing to take place in the level of cis algebra. Uh, it, otherwise we don't get any interesting application. So, so in the hyperbolic group case, it use post is sub, small subalgebra in an essential way because the original smooth dense subalgebra coming from property RD would not help to detect the information about delocalized uh, you know, cyclical cycles. So, 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 so Michael's work is essential. I think this is where his paper is. So actually in this computation, another important technique is coming from Alan's paper. In his proof, you know, when, so Alan talked about finitely summable uh, module content character, but in the C, C, C the summable case, and so Alan in this paper proves that his Chain character and the JL co-cycle equivalent. So we actually use some of the technique in his proof. Okay, so I should mention that Paolo, Thomas, and Zanobi have a different approach. Um, it would be interesting to compare like the two different approaches. Uh, I think, well, at least it's not completely clear to me from their approach, you know, it gives uh, 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 John Lotus high ADA. Uh, I also should say that to, should mention to get, in general, we, so John Lotus high ADA, the convergence issue is more restrictive. So we introduced uh, a version of high ADA whose convergence 
is much more flexible, but I, I don't want to get into those technical details at the moment. Okay. All right. So I also want would like to mention uh, Shigen John computed the pairing in in the polynomial growth case. I think he will talk about this. And then Paolo and the uh, costume and uh, Yan Li and Xiang, they computed the pairing recently of the localized cyclical cycle with high low in in the Lee group case. Uh, well, there are other interesting work in this connection. I'm not mentioning one by one. And um, also the work of Dili, Kofan, on secondary invariance. Okay. So they are all spiritually connected, also may not be technically connected. Okay, so let me also mention a natural application to high index theorem for manifold with boundary. So in the case, for example, if the boundary has positive scale curvature, and so we are talking about the manifold with boundary, like near the boundary, it's a product structure. So in this case, you can just extend to like a non-compact manifold and it has positive scale curvature, you know, outside this, uh, this M. So in this case, you can actually define. So, so the index of the M, well, let's see this extended DM bar that's in the case area of the group C style okay. uh, Actually, it, it is an open question whether these kind of elements come from the bond column map. That's another. Okay, but in any case, so for example, if G is hyperbolic, then you can try to pair this up with a delocalized cyclical cycle and uh, it turns out you get you get the, uh, again, uh, lot of high ADA on the boundary. Well, interpreted like in, so I think a lot, lot of uh, high ADA, there's some convergence issue. So one needs to modify his high ADA, but, but, but th this provides a nice uh, application. Okay, so I think in, well, I, my time is uh, almost up. So I just want to say, I want, uh, actually want to raise an open question. So, and so, so these are computation all for the Dirac operator. So I want to raise the question, how to compute the pairing of cyclical cycle with high low for in, in the relative signature operate situation when you have a homotopy equivalence of two manifold. Okay, so before I do this, I want to just quickly say that actually they are result which explains that in such a situation, the high low is like partially computable. And one result I want to mention is the additivity, you know, from structure group to this high low invariance. And this has an interesting consequence that the structure group is infinitely generated in some cases, which means there are lots of manifold which are homotopy equivalent to M, but not homeomorphic. Well, in, in some sense. Okay. All right. So so and in essence, this is provides a way of computing high low in some cases. So that it's an ad, yeah. It's a formula. Also, it's multiplicative. So this additivity is multiplicative, and uh, and in some special situation when the group is residually finite, those invariants can be approximated on the final covers. So so that's another result. Um, okay. So so finally, and those provides evidence. Somehow, you should be able to compute the pairing of delocalized cyclical cycle with high law of such a relative signature operator, but uh, find an explicit formula involving the homotopy equivalence F. 
so 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 I would like to end with this open question and uh, yeah thank you very much thank you Gulian thanks Okay, great ending with an open question. Uh, so uh, 